intro image will probably be the entire image that people get to see uh, online, but we're, we're good. Awesome. OK, great. Uh, I really expected like five people to show up uh, this morning, so it's great to see that more of you actually decided to, uh, to get out of bed. Uh, I know some of us may have had some challenges getting out of bed uh, today, and uh, it was a long evening last night for some people that I saw up very late, 3 o'clock. Plus, bug squashing went on until at least 3 o'clock last night, so that was very awesome. Um, and now I'm noticing that on my little presentation screen here, I am covering all of my notes with a clock. So I'm going to take one second to change something here and move this over there, this over there, done, and all right, uh, good. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. For people, um, for people online, there's like 100 people in the room here. It's just a fantastic session of only beautiful people. We are just, see, beautiful people, at least. Maybe not hundreds. <laughs> These are hardworking people that showed up, uh, even in spite of alcohol and bowling and lots of other bug squashing fun here. Um, also, if you're watching this from the future, I know you're watching this on Google Glass while roaming through space in your spaceship. Please don't crash. Thank you. Okay. Um, exactly, yes. I know that Ryan in 40 years will be watching this. Um, so uh, obviously, I was really honored to learn that I get to give a presentation about <laughs> myself and what I've learned uh, through uh, building a recurring revenue model for the last uh, 13 years. Um, so I'm really excited to, to do that. But I have a, a quick update for you guys, because I thought that there might be uh, a change in plans. Um, so last night, this was, when I say last night, I mean like six hours ago or so. Um, I outsourced my presentation to a Bulgarian, a Scotsman, and an Englishman um, at a bowling alley downstairs. Um, and unfortunately, it, through legal constraints, the legal team said the presentation they made was not necessarily fit for consumption through a worldwide audience. Um, I will give the uncensored version of that presentation if you want after we shut down the live feed. OK, good. Excellent. Um, it's very interesting, to say the least. Um, but uh, I do have a presentation about recurring revenue models. I'll start by saying um, who I am. So hi again for people that um, haven't seen me in a while or don't know who I am. Uh, I'm Ryan Osmick, uh, the ex-president of OSM. Uh, there's now uh, a two-person, maybe three-person ex-presidents club where we hang out in retirement land and play shuffleboard. It's very relaxing. It's very nice. Uh, I get to wear sandals to conferences now, which feels fantastic. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called PicNet. Um, I'll tell you, obviously, about what we're doing and how we've changed over time through this session here. Um, at our offices, uh, we definitely try to have it fun. So I do a lot of putt-putt golfing in our offices. So I'm hopefully moving on to the pro circuit soon. But it's a fun place. Um, yeah. So who should be in this room? Just to make sure we've got the right audience here. Um, are there folks here that are um, web consultants? Would you can describe yourself as a web consultant if you're in the room here? OK, great, good. Um, people here that are extension developers, Joomla extension developers. Awesome. And people that consider themselves entrepreneurs or business folks. All right, good. My type of room. Because I was going to have to change the entire presentation um, if you were a trust fund baby, if you were a billionaire, or if you just weren't interested. <laughs> Gosh darn it. One of the perks of being ex-presidents is that current presidents get to make fun of you. It'll come back. Don't worry. We'll see you in the retirement home. Um, so, uh, so I'm glad to see that. Uh, Paul decided that this is a good place for him to, uh, to join us here. Um, the format of the session today, I want to do a little differently, not because I just made the presentation a few hours ago. That would absolutely not be why. Um, it would be because I think what I'd like to have is um, some short stories to tell you guys about some lessons learned uh, through the 13 years of building our um, recurring revenue model. 
And also, I want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to share some experience yourself, because I see this as a unique opportunity of all of us as peers to share knowledge so that we can go back and implement them in our own enterprises and, and businesses. Um, this is all about interrupting me uh, by walking in late, uh, by, by doing whatever you need to get my attention. So if you want to yell and scream, just don't throw things at me. That's the only thing I ask. Um, questions are welcomed the entire time. Um, laughs are probably even more welcomed. Uh, there's a lot to talk about today. Uh, I changed the number of things that I wanted to share with you guys uh, quite a bit. Um, and since I was bad in getting here early, uh, we might actually move our way back up the list here to less topics. Um, so I'm happy to chat with folks afterwards as well, because I think that this is something I have near and dear to my heart, because I want to see um, more businesses in our community succeed and to do so not at the cost of spending your entire life at the office. I want to help us all find more work-life balance. And I think one way we can do that is by helping each other build more sustainable business models. Uh, so just um, one other question for you guys. I, I'm interested in the types of folks that are in here, because I know that you're the right, beautiful, 100-person audience. But um, how many people here would describe themselves as a, a solo entrepreneur, running the business by yourselves, essentially? Good, excellent. Uh, and then folks here that are owners of a business that have, say, less than 10 people. OK, great. Um, we already went through a couple of these. Um, how many people here would you say that the majority of the work your business is doing is product development? Product development, building products. No. Oh, dear God. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> and the second question is, uh, how many folks here have businesses that have software as a service business models or SaaS business models? Okay, okay good. Right on. Um, Greg says, uh, I think understanding that is going to help me a bit as to where I think we can focus our discussions today. Like I said, we have a lot of topics. And uh, I think that the solo entrepreneurs that are in the room here pretty much make up the largest percentage of what we see in the Joomla marketplace. Um, and those are the folks that are oftentimes working uh, the hardest and building some of the best stuff that I think we need to share with more of the world, especially beyond uh, the Joomla world. And I want to. Um, prescribe a few paths as to how we can get there and be profitable and successful along the way. Um, so to start, I just thought I'd share a little bit about um, the background of what uh, PicNet is, uh, my company. Um, we're a company whose mission it is to empower the missions of nonprofits with affordable and effective technology. Um, I didn't say anything in there like, our mission is to build Joomla extensions. I didn't say anything in there about, our mission is to build the coolest technology that will be here and then gone in a year. Uh, it's really saying uh, we care and are very passionate about the nonprofit sector. And we know that we're good at technology. What tools we're going to build and how we're going to get there has evolved over time. And that evolution has made us a stronger business. Uh, and I think it's something that um, we can learn from as a community to see how we can grow uh, together. Uh, we're a certified uh, B corporation, um, benefit corporation. In the US, where we know there's a lot of capitalism going on, there's different types of ways you can incorporate. Uh, over the course of the last few years, um, there's been this growing area between pure for-profit companies um, and nonprofit organizations. And somewhere in the middle are social entrepreneurs or people that want to serve both marketplaces. Um, and B corporations are a very new um, legal vehicle in the US. And that's where our focus is, is to say, how can we be most impactful for society, not necessarily for shareholders, and we want to make as much money as possible. So we're neither a nonprofit or a for-profit corporation. Uh, I like to say that we are a not-for-much-profit <laughs> company. <laughs> Which is essentially what we, uh, we enjoy doing. Um, and like I said, we've gone through a tremendous amount of change. Um, we've kept 
PicNet as the vehicle, as the business that we've run through all of this change during the past 13 years, um, but it's been interesting to watch it uh, evolve and, and grow. In the past, uh, we had one main offering that we had as, as a business, uh, and that was probably what a lot of you guys do in the room here, which is custom <laughs> web development and web design services. Um, so the model was pretty straightforward. Uh, we knew we wanted to help organizations do things like fundraise online, get people to come to their events, make sure they have a great presence online. Um, and the way we did it was um, before even Mambo, we would do custom CMS development. And then we started to do a lot of Mambo-based development. And then we moved, obviously, into Joomla-based development. Um, over time, though, as I said, that's, that changed quite a bit. Um, today, we have three main offerings. Um, we have a flavor of Joomla for nonprofits called Soapbox CMS. Um, we then took everything that we had in Soapbox, and we looked out to the marketplace, and we said, we want to work with more people than just those that want to have their entire websites replaced. But we love Joomla, and our engineering team knows it very well. Um, and we have a good understanding as to what we can do with it. Um, so what if we took the Joomla CMS, we removed the CMS <laughs> from Joomla, and we just built extensions that allowed organizations to do things like online fundraising and event management services and form building services. We provided that as a suite, and we presented it through a software as a service model, um, which is a big change that I'll talk about in a moment. But that's what this second offering is. And then we became even more focused um, by saying our organizations were having problems just doing mass email communications online. And again, we said, well, what are the tools we have that we can do this and not do custom web development services? but still use the technology that we, we know and love across the way. Um, so that really changed our company from being a custom development shop into a SaaS-based company, into a product-based company. Um, for folks that are doing SaaS-based business models right now, can somebody just give a quick definition as to what SaaS is and, and how you're using it? Anybody? Sort of, I was a, a late one to raise my hand when you asked about SaaS, but um, what I'm in the process of, I have one client that's sort of my guinea pig, and I'm going to roll it out. That's that's the next step. But kind of a, a hosted distribution of Joomla that's focused on their niche, which in my case is a high school sports program. Awesome. So that's, what I'm doing. that's great. Yeah. Anybody else have a SaaS model they want to share briefly? Cool. I'm going to be giving you guys a lot of ideas, hopefully, so maybe we can get some out of the presentation uh, as well. Um, so this presentation is about the why and the how, and has it been successful? What are the results of this? Because my, um, my premise here is that I think all of us need to consider where we're at in our businesses and to see not necessarily do we need to completely change the model, but can we see a path of evolution that brings some more balance to our lives and helps us better serve the people we really want to serve. Not just necessarily selling extensions to the Joomla community or necessarily just doing templates development, for instance, but how can we hit the 90% plus of the marketplace out there uh, that isn't using Joomla and provide them Joomla tools without necessarily telling them they have to replace everything they've got already. So. Uh, the story for PicNet is that there's really three dates that changed our company's uh, history. Um, the first one, there, there'll be a quiz on one of these. I need you guys to figure out what the date is. I'll, I'll give some sort of prize that I'll make up, maybe my, my phone, because I'm tired of reading email. Um, the first date is uh, February 16th of 2001. Uh, that was the date that we formally incorporated our business. Um, Myself and my business partner were friends at a university in Southern California, uh, and we decided to take this idea that we had in college and make it a business way back in 2001. Um, here is the question. Does anybody know in, I'll give, a, I'll give a hint. Anybody know why September 15th, 2008 is important in financial history? 
Yes. What specifically happened on September 15th to a particular business? Yeah, wait, who said that? Yes, exactly, a couple of people. Yeah, Lehman Brothers uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on September 15th. Uh, so why is uh, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers an important marker in uh, PicNet's history? Well, uh, that was the red flag that got raised for our nonprofit community that already didn't have much funds um, that said, essentially, in six to nine months, our nonprofit community is going to go through the toughest times it's probably ever seen. Because what typically happens is that if you're a nonprofit organization, you get your funding from the, the annual cycle before for the next year's work, essentially. You're fundraising for all the work you're going to do the next year. So they were going to survive through the end of 2008, and they were going to go through 2009. That gave us, essentially, a six to nine month period before our organizations really felt significant pain. And so we said, OK, we're lucky enough to say it's not going to hit us immediately, but we've got to plan to change very quickly. So essentially, we had nine months to shift our business model to go away from a pure custom web development model to something that was going to be more affordable for our community. Otherwise, we were going to have to do something completely different. Uh, one other date that foreshadows uh, the end of the discussion here. Uh, May 29th uh, was just a few days before I came here, which is the date that I was able to forecast that uh, the second quarter of the year was going to be our most financially successful quarter as a business. Um, and to see us being able to do this, serving the, the poorest organizations in the US through the crisis, and to be able to do it by changing our business model is really a reason why I want to, to share this with you guys, because I don't think there's anything um, special about what we did. It was just going through the pains of it and letting you guys know that if you're struggling or feeling like you're working a ton on a custom development model, there are other options in a SaaS-based and recurring revenue model here. In thinking about how you're going to make a potential transition to a recurring revenue model, um, I think there's at least two important early decisions that groups need to make uh, before they get there. Um, and these get kind of philosophical in the business sense. The first one is, uh, how do you envision your long-term ownership? What does it mean to you to be the owner of your business? How tied and close to it are you? And, and where do you see it going in the future? Um, so I can speak for what, we've, what I've thought at PicNet is, uh, I've always said I want PicNet to be a 100-year company. I want PicNet to last forever, long after I'm gone. I have no interest in selling it. I have no interest of going public on the stock market. Doesn't necessarily mean I want it to be small. I want it to be as impactful as possible, um, but I'm not interested in buy, or creating it and then flipping it as quickly as possible. Um, the benefits of that is that uh, there's stable ownership. As long as I'm around, the company knows essentially who's leading it and where it's going. Uh, the downside is uh, it's, uh, it can be painful from the funding process <laughs> if you're not willing to give up much ownership of your business, as I've talked to some folks about uh, just this weekend. Uh, and second, if something were to happen to me, what's going to happen to the business? Creating a succession model is really important if you're looking to have a long-term um, business, especially if it's a recurring revenue model. The second early question to ask yourself is, how are you going to fund this transition from being more of a, a custom development shop into a recurring revenue model? On the, the PicNet side of things, shifting, what we ended up doing is we said, you know, the custom development uh, has made us a lot of money, and we were very thankful for it. Um, but we essentially started to save a lot of that money on the side because we had a sense that it wasn't always going to be this good. <laughs> we weren't always going to be able to sell uh, great projects at um, the prices we were. Um, so what we decided to do is, during the financial crisis, uh, at a time in America where banks were not giving anybody any loans, in fact, they weren't giving college students credit cards anymore, uh, what, what were we going to do to fund this transition? And the reality was we had a choice between uh, capital infusement, like were we going to ask for external money to fund the engineering time that we needed, or were we looking for 
maybe a longer term slow growth. And we decided for the long term slow growth model because we said ownership is really critical to what we see our business and our values being. And if that's true, then getting the capital infusement to be able to get the money we need to build rapidly um, was not really the option that we had on the table to, to play. So uh, really what it comes down to is what's your mission and what's the ownership model that you see for your business. And that's going to provide a lot of direction to you as to how you're going to fund a potential transition. Um, my own personal recommendation is that uh, if you're willing to be lean and mean for uh, a couple of years, um, I see a lot of benefit in a long-term slow growth model, mostly because you really get to understand the audience and the people that you're selling to. Um, and you become part of their community rather than dropping in with a quick service and hoping that it's going to make it or be a flash in the pan to move on to something else. So. One of the, the things that we learned is that uh, while it was good to use Joomla, it wasn't necessarily great to use Joomla as a, a key marketing device. I mean, I've been so involved in the Joomla community for so long. Uh, I've, I've had a chance to be the president of OSM. And I can't, maybe there's less than five times where somebody was super impressed by my involvement in the Joomla community that it made a buying decision change for them. Um, and the reality is that if we were looking to serve a non-Joomla larger audience, they just didn't care. Like, I care about Joomla. Most of the organizations we work with, they think it's an interesting idea, but it is not a reason for them to make a buying decision. I think that the folks here, and I've talked to a few of you already, have amazing products that are in the form of extensions or templates or services for Joomla that is serving, again, 2.7% of the world's web marketplace. And I want us to serve the other 96.3% of the marketplace, if I did my math right, I don't think I did. Um, but the larger percentage of the marketplace by thinking of ways that we can be shifting out of a Joomla-centric model into something that goes into a broader marketplace. Um, so if we've got this great stuff out there, what are the ways in which we can change our models slightly so we can hit that broader audience there? One thing that, uh, that we made the tough decision on is that uh, we needed to change our pricing. Um, and again, I had a lot of good discussions with folks here about pricing specifically in the Joomla marketplace. Um, what I found at PicNet is that we were working really, really hard. Um, and as a not-for-much-profit company, we still needed to make a profit. Otherwise, we weren't a business. We were a charity. Um, and so we said, well, Going into the financial crisis, being really frustrated by working super long hours, um, we realized that we needed to raise our pricing because we felt that what we were doing is providing a lot more value than what we were actually charging clients. And I really want folks in this room that are selling extensions and are doing template development and doing custom development to think about that because I feel that a concern I have in the Joomla marketplace is that there's often a race to the bottom when it comes to pricing versus value. And I think that there's got to be some ways in which we can help each other from a business perspective uh, to be thinking about how can we reach a larger audience and to get the real value out of the products that we're creating. Um, one of the things that uh, we ended up doing uh, is saying, you know what, for some of our products that we were offering, we were going to effectively need to, to double our pricing if we were going to make the SaaS model work. Uh, so we did that. We doubled our price because we said that's just what we feel is right for the marketplace, and that's what we feel we're valued as. And we did see a drop off in uh, new business, but we were also very transparent. Um, our pricing is right on our website. Everybody can see it. You can go to our websites. Um, what we found out is that we became more profitable and our revenues ended up increasing after the financial crisis ended. Even though maybe we worked with less organizations, we were working with those that I think were a bit more stable and understood and matched our values to, to their values. Nobody has interrupted me yet, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't interrupt me. So if people have questions or if you're thinking about things from a pricing model, um, I'm definitely interested in, in hearing that. Um, and this is one place where I love to pause uh, to say, have other folks dealt with or been frustrated by 
trying to figure out the right pricing match for their offerings? And do you have any sort of feedback that you can share in a room of fellow business owners about that pain you have? And the first hand already goes up. Yeah, I think that's a good question that I probably still can't answer, other than it's a little bit of experimentation. But the other thing I would say is that we really started to wear our values on our, <clears throat> on our sleeves. We really started to go out to the marketplace and say, this is why we do what we do. These are the kinds of people we want to serve. This is how we want to serve them. And by doing that, it attracted the right types of customers to us. So we did have existing customers that were grandfathered and um, kept in the older pricing models. We encouraged them through upgrading processes to come to the newer price points by saying we have these new offerings. If you switch to the new offerings, you then roll into the new price points. Um, but I think that we just ended up finding uh, a, better, a better match for us when it came to the types of clients that we were going to work with because we were a bit more direct in our marketing and more direct as a saying, this is the value of what we're providing. Raising our prices forced us to do this. One of the discussions that Mike and I had during lunch is that I am a, um, a self-aware, poor uh, product marketer. I'm really bad at product marketing. I'm very passionate, very, very bad at product marketing. Um, raising your prices makes you become a better salesman really quickly. <laughs> you have to, to, to survive. Um, but it also helps you really focus on value rather than low cost provider. Um, so that's the best answer I've, I've got, but I think it's a pain point that a lot of us face. Yep. Right. Yeah, and that was a conversation I had last night, and you more eloquently summarized it. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and I don't want to uh, create the illusion that we are colluding together to increase pricing, but I do think that it is important for us to be considering our pricing models and saying, are we getting the return on our investment and the real value that we think we should be out of the products that we're building in the community? to the bottom idea. Um, I know when I started doing freelance web stuff a long time ago, I thought, okay, I've got to establish myself, and the way to establish myself is to build a client base up, and the way I do that is to set my prices low. And, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, it helped me get started, but the race to the bottom, nobody ever wins that. Mm. You know, I mean, somebody's somebody's always going to come in a little bit lower and then you're, if your only differentiator was I'm a low price operator then um, you know the next time somebody comes in there then your only choice is to match their price right you're still going to be the low price operator so I mean I think for anybody who um, you know wants to really have a high quality high value growing business that race to the bottom is 
bad idea. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that we've learned in moving to um, a SaaS-based recurring revenue model is that that pressure of the race to the bottom gets pushed down significantly because the contract that I place in front of my clients is no longer you know, $8,000, $20,000 project. It's you know, $99 per month. We see the long-term growth, we can evaluate that, we can see our revenue opportunities, but it changes the, the discussion quite a bit. Um, two key factors in thinking about your pricing models. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the first factor is uh, the product and service uh, and how it's different than everything else in the marketplace. Um, so to give you, you know, a sense is, you know, how does your product how is it different than everything else that's out there? So to give you a sense of what we've done, obviously we, we only serve nonprofit organizations, so everything we create can be finely tuned to that specific vertical, that specific community there. Um, the question for you guys uh, is how can you be providing added value to specific targeted audiences? Because if you're looking to, not necessarily, nobody's looking to increase their prices. Everybody just wants to have higher profits, and pricing is one way to do that. So if you're looking to increase your profits, one way you can do it is by really matching yourselves up better with a specific audience. A Joomla audience is one audience, but they're an audience of folks that are already kind of bought into a technology community, but you don't provide a lot of added value uh, around that. What can you do if you were to go to a specific vertical, maybe you're to work in the, the medical industry, you're able to work in manufacturing and be very highly specific and focused on that, where your matching of values allows you to increase prices and therefore increase profitability. Um, the second one, without going back to um, microeconomics classes for some of you, um, is looking at the elasticity and a demand curve. So just understanding your marketplace and understanding essentially how badly do they need the product that you're offering? The more elastic it is, the more control you're going to be able to, to have. Or the, understanding the elasticity is going to let you know, essentially, how much you can change your prices. Are you offering something that's so unique that nobody else has it that you get to name your price? Or is it the same thing that five other people have, and suddenly you're in this race to the bottom, as Paul was saying just a moment ago? Um, the second part of it, of course, is their willingness to pay curve. So in understanding the people that you're serving, uh, how much money do they have to spend? And then second, um, even if they have the money, are they willing to spend it on your product versus something else? So being able to understand who the audience is and how you're working uh, is important. I say that because, and this is tiny for the people in the back, is that all of the pricing models we have at PicNet are actually based on organizations' annual budgets. So in the US, um, every nonprofit organization has to publicly declare, here is all the money we brought in for the year, all of our revenue for the year. And what we said is, well, we want to serve organizations with affordable and effective technology. So to reach our mission, we said, um, we think that the smallest organizations, the one-person nonprofits, deserve the same awesome technology as the very large organizations. Just because you have more money doesn't mean that we think you're less or more of an organization or more important to the world than a small organization. So we built a model that, if you think about it from an economics perspective, just goes up along that willingness to pay curve and says, we have an offering for people that have different ability to pay along that curve. So that folks that had less money to spend with us, we could still provide the same product and service for them. People that had more money, we could charge them more. And because the people at the top were paying more than the people at the bottom, we're able to have a smooth ability to grow the business over time because larger organizations were subsidizing smaller organizations' budgets. So thinking about a price. Oh. So for the same service? Same service, same amount of, say, dis I'm just making up things, disk space, um, offering, same thing. The only difference is that one's a small organization and has less ability to pay, and one's a large organization. Yeah? How long has the pricing model been in place? It's been about, for the CMS services we've provided, about five years, maybe six years now. Have you ever had a larger nonprofit come to you and say, why are we paying more for exactly the same thing? 
Yeah, we go right to the philosophy of why we exist, and we tell them the story about using open source software. We tell them how we're value aligned with what they're doing as an organization, and how the work, the money that they are spending is helping us fund social change for an entire marketplace. I don't think anybody said that because of the pricing model. They probably didn't like the way I dressed one day or other reasons. <laughs> but no, nobody's ever said that. In fact, what ends up happening is a lot of people, um, when we tell them we're a benefit corporation and all these other things, that gets them more interested in what we're doing because they know that we know where they're coming from. Um, so I would say for us, it's worked out really well. Um, I don't know anybody else that really does this in any marketplace. Um, but it's an example of saying experiment with a pricing model beyond just saying there's one price for everybody. There's different ways to do it. We just happen to do it this way. Ah, uh, yeah. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> um, so, Ryan, what is it? What is it? I, I understand, you know, your uh, summary description of a B corporation that, right. that, that's somewhere between nonprofit and, and all for profit. I mean, what is if I'm a potential client and you say we're a B corporation? I mean, what does that mean to me? Uh, as the client. Yeah. So for the way we describe it is that, um, and, and I think I would recommend all of you think about this for your businesses. I gave a presentation on um, this at j and Beyond last year. I was really honored to have a chance to do that. But in thinking about a sustainable business model, it tells the client, uh, you know, our, our values are such that we're planning to be here for a long time. You know, we're not looking to make a quick dollar or a quick euro and get out of the marketplace. We want to serve you for as long as possible. Um, it means that uh, we are focused as a business on um, not just the profitability of the business, but also in the people that we work with, the people that we employ, and the people we serve. Um, and then finally, that it's important to us to understand our relationship to our communities and how what we're doing as a business connects with the larger community that we operate in. One of the other things to think about is, are you going to go down a distributed software model or a software as a service model? Um, there's never been, I don't think, a PicNet built component extension template or anything on the Joomla directory or on the, uh, the JED or in the showcase or anything like that. Um, and it's mostly because we're, we don't see ourselves selling extensions to the Joomla marketplace. We're seeing ourselves using Joomla to sell to the rest of the world outside of the Joomla marketplace. Um, but you know, I think for a lot of us, that's a, that would be a big change and a big risk for people that have you know, a significant portion of revenue coming through the JED and through other um, Joomla properties. Um, but I would say that you know, one of the things that we found was actually a more important selling proposition to the folks we were working with was that we had the understanding of who they were as organizations and less about the technology side. Like the number of actual sales conversations I get into that are about specific things in the technology are, are very few. And more often it's about, you know, how do we solve their particular challenge? And if we were to move the route of saying, here's all the features and benefits that we have in our products and services, um, I don't think that would have allowed us to be as successful as saying, here's how we're going to help you solve problems A, B, and C. Drilling into those verticals and then making a, a focus on that was very important to us. The other thing is that uh, we wanted to provide organizations a spectrum of services and not just code. Like We didn't want to be an organization that produced software and then sold the software and that's all we did. We really saw ourselves as a, a business that wanted to do to help organizations with online communications. If you're going to do that, um, it's a lot easier for us to do that in a SaaS model where we're helping them across the entire spectrum of everything they're doing online rather than a point solution for, you know, we have a, a donations tool. So rather than just selling a donations extension, we're able to line up everything from their donations extension to the design of it to then how we can do 
marketing with them, how we can align that with the, the wording that they're using, all the way down to the database they're using to store all of that data. It's much easier for us to do that in a SaaS model than it is on just a point solution with a, a product. Um, in the SaaS model especially, uh, keeping the product uh, simple, or at least the offerings simple, is really important. Um, we have three products, um, and each of the products we have likely does a lot less than the point plays do. So we have an events tool that does probably only 80% of what Eventbrite has. We have a donation tool that probably only does 80% of what some sophisticated PayPal development can do. Um, but we think that there's a lot of value in the simplicity of what we can be doing. So as we're racing to uh, add more features, we're trying to combat that by saying, Having a simple offering is really important to organizations that we're working with. Um, and also that we see the value as the combination of all of these products aligned together more than just one at a time. So I know that uh, some folks have you know, 10, 20 different products uh, that they've got in the Joomla world, which I think is fabulous. And if we could string those together in a suite, which I think a lot of folks do, I think that's a, a great offering. Um, it also has allowed us to keep our support costs low, so there's less things to break <laughs> or less challenges if we have less products to offer, um, and that keeps our engineering team happy. But all of it really goes back to client satisfaction. Yes? Do you have any bindings? So if you do an agreement with uh, a client, you yes. to stay there for three years or something? Uh, yeah, our, our, yeah, so. In, um, in the CMS offering they had, the, the price table that we had before, um, it's month to month, um, which is another selling uh, proposition, a unique selling proposition for our clients. But it's also the reality that uh, if an organization is using their website and they like who they're working with, they're less likely in reality to move from it. Um, on some of our more affordable pricing, <laughs> our affordable products, um, it is something that has a year-long uh, contract to it. And then it gets renewed annually every year for another year. But you don't have any start fee? Uh, we do for some of our products. So if they're doing a full website with us, there's a design fee and a startup fee for all the strategic services around it, and then a recurring fee after the launch of the site. So then we will have an ordinary uh, in, uh, in investment in the stock? Right, yeah. So then at that point, they're paying, say, $99 per month. Mm -hmm. But then and there's no other kind of added on fees after that. that Say again? That you tell about. Right, exactly, yes. <laughs> there's a lot of hidden fees <laughs> that are very small fonts. Um, I like this slide mostly because I like In N Out Burger, which people that are from the US or have been to the US uh, know that not only do they make amazing hamburgers and milkshakes, um, but they also have one of the simplest restaurant menus in the world, at least I think, and provide an awesome, awesome product. So I think you get to choose as a business. And I think what you get to choose is uh, the number of offerings and the simplicity or the complexity of your products. Um, they're a ridiculously profitable private company making tons of money that has really focused on a couple of products. So we don't have to go feature crazy. And if you're thinking that you do need to go feature crazy, um, have people heard of Basecamp or 37 Signals? Uh, so Jason Fried, the, the CEO and one of the founders over there, has written a lot about their business model. And one of the things I take away from that is on the screen is the, the four main products that they have. Um, from base camp to, to campfire. Um, but he, what he said is that there's going to be a spectrum of clients that we could work with, from very small organizations to huge enterprises. And where they want to be on the spectrum is right here, and they never want to change. And they are OK with people leaving their business if they're growing, changing, evolving, have more complexities to them. Because they said the cost of chasing clients up to the enterprise is more expensive in terms of long-term growth, support, upgrading, all that other stuff, and takes their eye off the prize of serving the people in the middle and the small end. And that's really tough. That's tough for me, especially, because if you've come from a custom model where you're making you know, maybe $10,000, $20,000 on a particular good project, if one of those larger organizations says, 
Well, Ryan, we'll throw a big pile of money at you if you just add these couple new features to your product. That's really, really tempting. And the challenge there is that you see that and you say, we would love the capital infusement right now. The long-term challenge to that is that unless our team were to significantly grow, just tossing new features into our products isn't necessarily going to be great for this part of the market that we're trying to serve. So if you're looking at we have a particular vertical or a part of the spectrum that we want to serve as our audience, make sure to stick to that. Because if you can do that, then you can align all of your products around that and be more successful and more, more profitable. Uh, I know we're running a little short on time here because my computer was being so fussy. Um, but this is just to say <laughs> something that I don't say myself very well, which is stay off the features treadmill. Stop always trying to add new features to your great already existing products. Consider taking your great products and marketing them to different audiences with specific messaging and providing value around them rather than throwing more code at the challenge. There's definitely ways that we can be making more money, not necessarily by adding more features and more complexity to our products, but by making them simpler and just finding the right clients to work with. I think a lot of that goes into marketing. I'm not a great marketer, <laughs> but I do think that that's a, a, a much better way for us to be considering in our, our growth. Um, focus on a, a unique value proposition. So I say that because the, the business term is typically a unique sales or selling proposition. And if there's a way that you can align that value more effectively with what you're selling, I think that's, that's critical. One of the things that we had a challenge with is that we were going through the process of um, as a, as a business moving into SaaS, uh, we had done some hosting services in the past, but we didn't really understand what the infrastructure costs were going to be and how growth looked like. If you're moving into a SaaS model, make sure to uh, really take a hard look and uh, be extremely conservative in the size of these uh, numbers as they grow over time. Um, and important, uh, don't underestimate the support costs. I was shocked to hear how many great folks here do so much free support services for their clients, which is fantastic, which is, is really, really cool. Um, when you're moving into that SaaS model, uh, we found that uh, support costs significantly uh, went up. Um, and it was mostly because of, um, of poor education and having products that may have been too complex for the needs of the audience. Simplifying the products increasing education on the front end, doing a better job of training, allowed our SaaS model to be more successful. Uh, we've already talked about focusing on uh, select verticals. Uh, and this is where I get to use the whiteboard for at least one second. OK, I can't put my sandals on, so we're going barefoot. Um, OK, I'm going to draw three quick curves here. We've got uh, this curve, which is not a curve at all. It's a straight line. Uh, we've got uh, we've got this curve, which is I call the uh, the awful cyclical cycle of running a typical custom development business, uh, and then we've got this curve here, which is more of that the hockey stick that they always talk about in Silicon Valley, which supposedly if you move to San Francisco and you start a tech company, everybody does this, right? <laughs> it's like oh my gosh. You're doing SaaS and you're in San Francisco. Um, what we did is an evolution from each one of these curves. Uh, this wavy curve here represents the, the custom development, custom project curve that we'd be on. Where I know many of you have seen this, you get a swell of clients and then you have a trough of like not getting clients for you know a month or so and then back and forth, back and forth. Difficult on your cash flow, tough for you to be able to be sustainable, difficult to innovate in. The next one is a retained support model where you've got this green line. The challenge with this is what this is saying is that, yes, it's flat, which means that you don't have to worry about the ups and downs of where you're going as a business. And you can predict more effectively. Um, but for every new opportunity you bring in, you increase your headcount, you increase your costs. So your costs are always chasing your revenues. And you're not really able to see better growth. We'll be there in just a minute. I know. I had to start 15 minutes late because of my own computer. Um, and then 
And then the last thing to say is where I want to see you guys more in the SaaS model is this red line here. Because essentially what we're saying is costs shouldn't be chasing revenue. We want the two of them to start diverging. Uh, and having a model that moves into SaaS gets us off of a straight line and gets us off of the crazy ups and downs. Uh, I think I, oh, look at that. <laughs> I thought I had two more slides. I'm done. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you, guys.